This is The Forge Project, a self-development coaching service and community that is dedicated in providing the leadership and guidance to drive improved mental, physical, and energetic well-being for men. Yeah, my uh, my business has completely shifted, and I nowadays I only take work that comes to me. I'm no longer uh, putting putting a knife in my mouth and hunting down clients. And now, because uh, you know the bigger calling is is just helping guys. Um, you know that's that's much more profitable on on many fronts doing it that way. Yeah, for sure, Justin. I mean, this is an outgrowth for me too because, you know, I was a power lineman. I trained many apprentices, young men. And mm-hmm. I stopped doing that five, six years ago. And this kind of, a lot of them kept following me. And, and actually that's how I ended up a little bit into this space. Yeah. And, you know, uh, so what, what is it that, that brought you to this? Because I, I feel like the common thing is that a lot of guys hit some sort of trauma. And that brings them to the whole red pill, blue pill conundrum and try to for, like sit, like figure out where they stand within that. And it usually comes from a place of pain and anger. It's, it certainly seems to be the majority of the case, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, for me, it was two parts spread out from 1991 until maybe 2011. So mm. um, the first one was when I burned myself uh, with, elect- with a 12,000 volts as a single father of a, of a three and four year old boy. Uh, and then the recovery from ground zero and being in almost a hundred thousand dollars debt, 75 to be exact. Um, that right there kind of red pilled me to what was really important. And of course, you know, my dating life at that time, uh, with all the single moms, a very different scenario in 1991, 92, 93, you know, dating was very different than it is now. Absolutely. Uh, it was dating, it, w- it was understood even with uh, uh, the women that if you're dating, you're dating multiple people to see who would be the best fit for, you know, a potential future. And it was kind of mutually understood. Uh, there, the one thing I notice about today's young men is it, it seems as though they get stuck in this lockdown very, very quickly within weeks where it's this serial Oh, if I'm dating this one person, I can't look or date at somebody else. So it, it just had a different feel to it back then where if we were dating, we were, we were dating. I expected her to date other people and she expected me. And if they didn't like that while we were dating, then we weren't a good match. Right. Uh, so, so it was just different back then. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Today there's a big loyalty thing right off the bat, right off the bat, right off the bat. That's asked for. That's right. Yeah. And, and, and then, um, uh, 28 years ago, I, I did marry a woman, a 25 year old woman back then. And, uh, and she had two small children, a uh, three and a four year old. And I had a three and a five year old by mm-hmm. the time we married. And it was quite successful. A wonderful, wonderful marriage. Uh, we had a rocky spot about 2012. And mm-hmm. then 2013 in December, I read, uh, Rolo's book it's just a month or two after it was released and I go oh yeah I mean I felt like I felt like half that stuff was sitting in me I couldn't put the words together you're familiar with the rational mail yes yes yeah so I read that and then I kind of just set it aside and uh it must have stuck with me because over the years it just uh you know my relationship with her improved tremendously and grew in incredible ways the attraction levels went up uh and uh it, uh, it was pretty amazing, but there was some trauma there at, uh, in 2012 and 13, where, uh, she had gotten some marriage counseling advice and her advice from a marriage counselor was she needed space and she had, uh, moved out for a period of time. And, uh, I didn't take that well. And I just shut everything down and, and it ended up for her in a uncomfortable spot, uh, where she really just wanted to come home. So she got really bad advice from marriage counselor. Uh, 
yeah. at the time. Really, really bad advice. And she would tell you that today that, you know, those people are, are death for your relationship uh, for the most part. Right. I, I have very few exposure, uh, exposures to people who say that going to marriage counseling actually saves their marriage. More often than not, I think I probably say about seven times out of 10 at the very least, it ruins things because they're just, you're just stirring a lot of stuff up when usually it's, it's a guy just not knowing what to do. And, yeah, it, it's, and it's a funny thing. Law. Yeah. It's, it's a funny thing. Those counselors, they're really employed as an extension of the court system. Mm-hmm. which is designed for what to, to mediate and negotiate and, and the split. Right. And one thing I've discovered is some of these marital problems and, and what I've actually focused on at the last couple of years and what I do much of my coaching and counseling on aside from fitness and, and uh, apprentices and life skills is long-term relationship game, which using my experience and the experience of others is a lot of times the male becomes unattractive to the female just Mm -hmm. by sheer complacency. And this certainly happened to me. You know, I had uh, gotten myself uh, uh, sick and I was sick at the time because I had taken antibiotics for a tooth infection that ended up into ulcerative colitis because of the antibiotics and the biome that gets messed up. Mm -hmm. And I had lost weight down to 167 pounds, stressed out at work because of it. And so I, over that course of a year, I had uh, really become quite unattractive and cranky. And, and then of course the, the, the woman doesn't understand this. So it's a part of her purpose. My purpose is gone, right? Well, in reality, she's not attracted to me anymore. So when I'm counseling these folks, I work on the men and I, I, I work on them becoming better versions of themselves. And lo and behold, by doing that, they lead in their relationship. And by leading in the relationship, the woman becomes quite attracted to, to their man. And these little problems aren't so big anymore. They kind of go away. Uh, now, I said a lot right there. There's a whole lot more that goes to it. And for those that I've counseled, I get quite in our space, it's called dread game, but really, you know, the first six or seven steps of dread game is working on yourself and improving your self attraction. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that generally fixes it. Most people focus on the dread game to where you really have amped up the overt uh, uh, female uh, sexual competition, anxiety within your mate. They kind of overemphasize that, but most of the issues are fixed when a, a man really just takes responsibility to lead the relationship. In of a course. nutshell. And of I course. do a lot of counseling on that. And it's been rather successful because by the time they get to me, they want things to work. And if nothing else, they walk away. I haven't had anybody that I've counseled that's actually split. Most of them repaired their relationships and they're better than before. But uh, I haven't had anybody split yet. But, you know, I don't have a giant client list. Right. Uh, but uh, it, it certainly worked for me and those around me. And, uh, and uh, so I advocate definitely the use of dread and maintaining your attraction. It's really, it's really about you first yes. as a man. And what Rollo would say is become your own mental point of origin. That's extremely attractive to a woman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they will lose weight, get in shape for you. If they even in the back of their instinctual brain, think that another mate would come in and steal you at that point. But if you're at this point in your relationship where you got a giant beer gut, you're eating Cheetos, you're just sitting on the couch complaining about shit and life, right? Complaining about work, acting weak and vulnerable, since we've all been taught to be vulnerable, then yeah, a woman's not going to want you. She does not want a man that other men don't want to be and that other women wouldn't want to sleep with. Yes. Yep. I completely agree. And you mentioned something key that I'd like you to unpack for those that don't understand fully. And, and just real quick, I want to back up, uh, moving forward. How would you like me to refer to you? Uh, just my actual real name is Thor. Okay. (laughs) That's perfect. I was born with the name (laughs) Thor. So Thor is perfect. Great. Great. Okay. Uh, all right. So Thor, could you just unpack a little bit when you said one's own mental point of origin? I know what you mean by that, but for, for a listener who's just coming across that term, could you unpack that just a little bit? 
No, that's a really good question. And, and so what that actually means is imagine, I like to use the analogy of taking care of yourself first. Uh, imagine you're on a flight on a jet airplane, you're going to, you're going to leave and the safety stewardess is up there instructing you about the oxygen mask. Should you lose pressure? You're sitting there with your family. You're sitting there with your friends. You're in this airplane. And she's telling you if the oxygen mask falls down and there's this giant emergency, what do you do with the oxygen mask first? Do you, you stick it on your child first or your wife or your girlfriend? No, you do not. You put it on yourself first so that you have oxygen so that you can stay conscious and rescue your child or your mm -hmm. wife. So what I'm saying is that you must take care of your full, yourself first. Self-care is important and that's mental, physical, and spiritual. You, that comes above, believe it or not, your children or your wife. It has to be that way. Once it's that way, they're attracted to you. They're happy because you are leading in the relationship. What's the old saying? A rising tide lifts all boats. Be that rising tide. And, yes. and their boats will be lifted naturally by that. That's what I mean by you are your own mental point of origin. So when it comes to a decision that you must make, are you thinking, uh, oh, how does it affect my wife? How does it do this? How does it do that? You're, you're, and I'm not being selfish here. It shouldn't be that way. It should be, you should already have the logic in your mind. How does it affect me? And then by extension them. Right. So that's really important. And, and that's how relationships should be led. And not only that, that's how your life should be led is how does this affect me? And then over there, uh, if, and that's, it, it should be done in that order. I know I'm kind of oversimplifying that, but does that make sense to you? No, I think that's a fantastic uh, way to put it. Um, especially just the, the oxygen mask uh, analogy. I, I personally liken it to life-saving uh, for, for like pools, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, when, if anyone's ever taken that kind of training, they teach you to preserve your own life at the very top. Because when you're ever dealing with someone who's drowning, they're in a panic mode and they will literally pull you down, step on your head and push you to the bottom of the pool just so they can get air. That's they, right. will, they will literally kill you. And so you have to prioritize your life above them. Um, and, and that means taking control of the situation and, uh, and, and making sure that your life is on top so that you can save them. Yeah, that's perfect. That's a perfect analogy. That one in and of itself right there. And I see through my client list and, and through my social circle, uh, a lot of women have trouble with this and especially a little bit older. I assume you're at least 40 years old. So at, okay. I'm, I myself am 58, but in our a little bit older age range, you'll see uh, the women prioritize their children above their marriage and their relationship. And this causes quite a few issues too. Uh, it's just not good for your thinking. Any human being must be their own mental point of origin, or ultimately you're going to have some, some issues. It, you'll always be disappointed. You'll always uh, struggle with decisions because you're placing somebody else above you. And of course, all our blue pill friends, we have to place the woman on the pedestal and, and worship you know, the ground that's walked on by that female. And mm -hmm. that's where we're trained in our society. And it, it's nice to compliment a female and in, in when it's deserved, but to artificially do that just because very dangerous idolatry and yes. it's unhealthy for our mental well-being. Yes. Yes. And society so, as a whole. Yeah. So what do you think in your estimation gets men away from being their own mental point of origin. Why do guys not even have that to begin with? And they, it's almost like the default is that they, they, they just grew up not having themselves as a mental point of origin. So like, what do you think is the, the crux or the, or the seed for that, that sort of situation to arise? Well, the factors will be varied, but I think primarily if I'm going to make it simple, it's competition mm -hmm. and it's actual male to male 
competition and bullying that's an issue and when i say bullying i don't mean the vicious kind but the kind of hazing that men do as they're growing up as young boys they realize they're in competition with each other they're out to hunt kill act like men and i think that's been restrained for at least 40 years now uh and so everybody gets a trophy so everything is brought down to or to a mediocre level. And I think for men to develop a mental point of origin, they have to have some struggles in life. You mentioned trauma earlier about coming to the red pill. If, if it's just given freely and life is easy and you have everything that you want, I mean, we can witness that with the trust fund babies, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't work very out very well for them. Many of them end up addicted to drugs, looking for something, but Uh, A young person has to have a rite of passage. We would simulate that trauma with rites of passage, particularly for men, uh, because a a woman's never had to do that. They've always been taken care of as a part of our species, Uh, but men had to prove themselves. And you can see it play out in sexual dynamics now and how people compete for mates. Uh, Men and women are very different. Um, I think that we're seeing a large amount of issues with mental point of origin as far as the millennials are concerned because they they are the culmination of everybody gets a trophy everybody's participate a participant uh, a lot of uh communitarian philosophies have been preached to them since they were young men and a large majority i i can't remember the percentage but it's very close to 50 percent if i remember correctly are being raised by single mothers which is not how you should raise young boys. It takes a man to raise a man. You can raise an, a, a grown boy, but to raise a grown man takes a grown man. It does. And that opens up a whole other conversation around why there's these single mothers. Uh, is it guys just leaving because they don't want to deal or they can't handle being a leader of a family? Um, or is it they're just having sex with women and leaving them to be single moms because they're just not intelligent enough to use protection? Um, but but in any case, I, you're right that it is a, it's something that's proliferating in society. And I absolutely noticed the shift in the 80s when there was both that that participation trophy that became this really big thing in the 80s. I remember it starting. Uh, and I, I was at a, uh, so I played a lot of sports uh, all throughout being, uh, you know, my childhood. And I remember being at an awards ceremony and the, every single kid was getting trophies. And I was like, looking around, like I knew I busted my ass, right? I wasn't MVP, but I busted my ass, right? And it was, it was for soccer. And I remember these kids, they were, getting trophies for largely sitting the bench the entire season because of whatever, you know, varied reasons why they sat the bench most of the games and, um, and they were getting trophies as well. And I'm like thinking to myself, damn, like I remember the feeling of like, I worked my butt off and we're getting the same trophy. Like, why is that? <laughs> you know, it's, it's not fair, but well, I mean, it's, it's in the act of fairness, on one end, but in my view as a kid, I'm like, that is not fair at all. Because I, there was like sweat that I put in uh, and getting my ass kicked on the field, um, you know, and they did nothing and still got the same reward. But very few will feel that way. Only those that work that hard, right? The majority will feel, majority are going to feel, Hey, I got a trophy. It's great. Yeah. You know, that 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 doesn't help. That doesn't help you for your mental point of origin. Although, you work so hard and everybody was brought to your level that anger right there makes you focus on your own mental point of origin. Mm-hmm. You know, the one thing we're not teaching them is the whole fairness thing. That's a whole nother, the fairness and the vulnerability thing that's going on right now. Life's yeah. not fair. Yeah. A vulnerability just means you're a weak wuss. Uh, <laughs> it's what it means. It means to be wounded, right? It comes from the root Latin word vulnerability. Uh, and it, it's just used so out of context in relation to, to men and women today. You know, uh, a millennial man is, oh, be vulnerable, be yourself. What does that shit mean, Justin? It doesn't mean shit. Uh, it's meaningless. Well, I find that in certain circles, it, it, it helps 
for certain types of healing. I do not find it to be very helpful in terms of polarity, in terms of women. So oh, I involve myself in like a lot of um, rooms on Clubhouse. And there's a lot Wouldn't of guys- Wouldn't you say that the vulnerability, when they say they need that, you're actually talking about sensitivity though? Okay, all right. Um, yeah, let me explain my, the situations that I've witnessed. And, and then I'd like you to, to explain what you mean. So I involve myself in a lot of rooms on Clubhouse, um, talking to a lot of uh, young and old men. And there are rooms in there where guys are openly talking about the traumas that they've gone through and it's, it's a new thing for them because there hasn't been ever sort of any kind of space for men to open up about the shit that's happened to them in their lives. And they carry around with them like real serious pain, burdens. Oh, that, sure. that, and and it, it's, it's led to um, really unhealthy projections, really unhealthy habits, um, mental frameworks that get them into all kinds of silly things and um, therapy just doesn't work because they're just, the therapist is detached. They're just saying like, let's just listen and let you unpack. And then there's no actionable solutions of how to move forward. It's just like, let's just look at the pain. And it's, it's not helpful. So in many of these rooms, these guys are allowed to open up. They're allowed to express these, um, uh, I would say, be vulnerable and express what's happened to them. And other men are listening to them and saying, hey, I've had a similar situation as that. This is how I got through it. This is what I did. Let me help you along and we can build you up so you don't have to have the same patterns in your life that are leading to so much sorrow. Uh, and um, and I've, I've found some of these rooms to be incredibly helpful for guys who do not know, they don't have that emotional intelligence, right? Um, they're just in a lot of pain. They don't know what to do with it. And it's led to you know, dr poor drinking habits, so just, just alcoholism, um, porn addiction, uh, and being very violent in their lives, um, like to themselves or their children or their spouse. And it's, it's been really helpful. The problem that I see with that is that some guys get stuck in these places. They get stuck being emotive because maybe it's, it's kind of like, if you can imagine a child who's been um, restricted from ever experiencing sugar, and then they get sugar and then they have free reign to that sugar and they just consume it like crazy because it's been denied to them so much. Right. And so that's what I find. Some of these guys, they get stuck in that, that consuming or expressing of these feelings. And they're like, yeah, this feels great and alive. It's like, well, you now have to kind of decide what you want to do. You can't just stay here. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So that's kind of what I've experienced as far as like vulnerability. Now you mentioned that, that, there's a difference between being sensitive and being vulnerable. So what, what well, do you uh, think about that? Sure. I, I think that like in those groups where men can expose their trauma, that's how I would do it. Expose their trauma that's affecting their lives, which I guess you could view that as a form of weakness, but it's actually a form of a, a rite of passage. You guys are exposing it so that it can be corrected kind of unburdening that mental loop that needs to be broken. I'm a strong advocate for hypnotherapy. I'm working towards my certification now oh, for cool. breaking some of those, those cycles. But um, when I use the terms vulnerability, it's in the context, at least while we're talking in the terms of what social media, media and, uh, and modern sexual dynamics, when how to attract a woman, show your vulnerability. It just doesn't fit. To, mm -hmm. I mean, you hear this over and over, show your vulnerability, you know, um, it, and, and that just doesn't work, guys. That's not only does it not work, it sets up a mental framework for you to create a habit. So if you have any success, any little tiny success at all, while showing your weaknesses, you'll use that as a platform to increase your weaknesses and show it even further, which is not healthy for you because it's not really attractive in the long run. No, uh, no. And you can look at our fathers, our grandfathers and our, uh, that generation. Yeah. They wouldn't express it as show your vulnerability. They would express it as something as like, okay, let's revisit your trauma and get past that shit. Cause we're in the here and now we're not in the past. Mm -hmm. Let's get, let, let's figure out what's going on there and let's move forward. Why are you seeking validation by replaying this trauma over and over? Right. 
And that's there what must I be would... an advantage or an ego protection for you to do so. And mm-hmm. if we can discover that, that's a habit. And with something like hypnotherapy, we can break that habit quickly. And you yep. can start experiencing life from your own mental point of origin, not as this trapped soul because of a trauma that happened in the past, which by the way, the past, all of that stuff in the past and all the stuff in the future for now, it's meaningless. It doesn't happen. It's, it's either happened or it hasn't happened, but what's happening now is really important. It is the majority of everything, if right. not everything. Well, what I found is like examining some of that stuff. Like I was listening to this one guy and he came forward and was like, you know, this is the first time I've ever told anyone about this. But when I was nine years old, my 15 year old sister molested me and it went on for like four or five years. Mm -hmm. And he, he didn't really come to terms with that until later on in life when he realized that something was wrong with his relationships with women. And things were just kind of very, things weren't sitting right with him. Right. And he had to connect those dots. And it wasn't until he was able to really examine and come to the truth of that, that trauma that happened to him as a child that, um, that uh, you know, he had to make that kind of change. And he was walking around with it in his present, um, you know, because he wasn't able to examine this sort of thing and just detach and let it flow back into the past. He kept that, that linkage. And, um, you know, it was just really, uh, you know, really, really wild to just, you know, hear that this had happened to him. And uh, like, I felt bad. Cause like, I've got a nine-year-old son. I couldn't imagine that possibly happening to him. It was really right. shitty, but, um, you know, you, you, you bring up a very good point in that at some point you, you, you have to let this, these things go. You have to make, a dedicated point to heal it and then move on because it's not going to help keeping that around like a big heavy backpack, like, yeah, acknowledge it, work it, and then let it go. Uh, Because women are just not attracted to that. And that's what I ask them. I say, is this working for you? being that open, you know, vulnerable, emotive guy. And that's like the new thing. Like that's like the new vision of masculinity. And I say, okay, great. Like, you're comfortable doing that fine but is it working for your goals yeah are women blowing up your dms (laughs) you know trying to get your time you know (laughs) yeah exactly exactly i i point to my my father had an example about things in the past affecting you now he did this he lived a a life and and god rest his soul If, if thor had a dad his name should have been odin <laughs> so i was fortunate enough to have a father but in his life his mother committed suicide in front of him with a pistol at 7 years old god damn he went to 19 different high schools mm-hmm. and so he had every reason to be a drug addled piece of shit worried about his past forever yeah he didn't do that he chose different different path what he what he did is is he told me his turning point was different. He was angry as a teenager, and at about fifteen, he found he found a bunch of puppies, and he killed the puppies. And then it bothered him for weeks and months on what he did and why he did it. And he said he would never be like that again. And then that guy from then on was the biggest dog lover ever. He adopted and rescued dogs everywhere. And just that act right there, he got himself into the air force. He came out, he was a, you know, became an electrician. He became a practical engineer and he lived quite an honorable life. Yes. He had some blue pill tendencies, but he's really a strong man. He did not show his vulnerabilities or even talk about his past. I had to dig that crap out of him years later. I went to work for him at 16. I graduated high school and worked for his business. Mm-hmm. And then he stayed in business for another four years. Then we both went on uh, and, and uh, got hired with a large utility. But uh, we were close for most of our lives. But uh, he certainly had a reason by modern standards to be one of those guys that was screwed up in his life. Can you imagine your mother at seven putting a pistol in her mouth and taking it out? He was there. He had two younger brothers. Hmm. They didn't do so well. But he did. Somehow he was angry. He took it out on those little puppies in his teens. But that triggered something. 
And so there's something. So everybody can be saved and they can do it. They just have to make that decision. Well, that makes me wonder, do you think that being a man is intrinsic in every male or there's only certain somethings within certain males that allow them to be men? I think the possibility exists in every man. And it depends on, 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 you know, if he had a benefit, he, he did not have any benefit for living that type of life where he could use it as an excuse for his ego and not do anything. And he made a decision that he would never be that way. And it was a solid decision, mm-hmm. no matter how painful or how much struggle he had to not use that, that trauma, he chose not to. Uh, now some people will, but they can choose not to, they can seek therapy. I'm a believer in therapy, especially the hypnotherapy. It seems to work really well, at least on par with regular psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. But if, if you're struggling with these things, uh, I would seek it out for sure. Any traumas, seek it out, Mm -hmm. decide, make a mental note to decide to become your own mental point of origin and decide that the things in your past no longer are masters over you. You are master over your own destiny in the here and now and for whatever comes forward. You only control one thing in life and that's what's in here. It's in your mind, it's what you think and how you organize and move those thoughts forward. And you don't even have full control over that because there's instincts, there's hormones and there's moods that move those around in your head. So, you know, the parts you can control I would say, learn how to control them. And therapy is very good at that. Right, right. And that kind of brings me to the next sort of thing you mentioned uh, in in my pre-conversation, living the dream and having a secret to living the dream. So is it connected to what you had just mentioned now? It is. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of known for the guy that's living the dream. And I'll tell you why. Because everywhere I go and everybody I see, I talk to them. I am a social talker. I'll talk to everybody everywhere. And this is my opener. And it's the opener I give freely to anybody that wants to even do day game with girls. And let's just use a woman as an example. When I say living the dream, I'll meet somebody. Let's just say at a convenience store or at a store. And I will introduce myself by saying, they'll say, how's it going? Or how's it, I'll ask them, how's it going? And they say, how's it going back or vice versa? They may engage with me and I'll say, I'm living the dream just like you, which always catches them off. They're going to answer in two ways, right? They're going to answer, well, I'm not living the dream. Let's say they answer that way. Mm -hmm. Well, when they answer that way, I tell them that's because you don't know the secret to living the dream. There's a secret to living the dream. There is. And here's the secret. Nightmares are dreams too. So we're all living the fucking dream, (laughs) right? Nightmares are dreams too. That's the secret. And they don't last. Mm -hmm. Do you understand the philosophy? You can have bad dreams. You can have good dreams. They're just dreams. So why not make it a positive? Right. Right. That's the secret to live in the dream. How many people do you walk down the street that have resting bitch face or asshole face, right? Why not be that guy that steps in? I'm living the dream just like you guys are. We're not living the dream. We'll know the secret. Nightmares don't last. Change it. Mm -hmm. And if somebody jumps up and says, yeah, I'm living the dream too. The very next part of the conversation is, that's awesome. What's your dream look like? Share it with me. I want to know. Now I have that individual talking about his favorite thing, which is what? His or her passion. Right. They're talking about his or her passion. I have a social connection right now and they have a bond with me. They think they know me because they're talking about their very favorite person. And I intently listen to that dream and I try to learn something uh, and enjoy that conversation. So that's just part of keeping my skills up and then living the dream is, is kind of, kind of how I throw it out there. I'm always living the dream. Why would you not want to live the dream in the context that a dream is enjoyable and it's fun. And sometimes they're not fun, but they don't last. Well, it also implies that we're always living in a dream of some sort and that it's up to you to, to wield it how you want to or perceive it how you want to. That is correct. It's a much, it has a much deeper meaning if you want to go down the esoteric path as well. Right. I, I, yeah, I can definitely see the esoteric part of it because some people might just look at it as uh, on an empirical level. 
mm-hmm. and say, oh, well, I'm not living the dream because my dream is to, I don't know, uh, live my life out on a yacht in the middle of the ocean and they're stuck in some little town in you know, the middle of America somewhere. That's right. And, you know, it, it, someone might be, here's the thing. Even if you're having the worst possible dream or worst possible nightmare, you're, here's the point. The point is you're having it. You're still capable of perceiving it. What do they say about pain? If you can feel it, you're still alive. Mm-hmm. Damn effort. Take another breath, dust off, stand up, start over. Yes. Yes, definitely. And that I think is one of the, the, the hallmarks of men that a lot of guys don't understand. They, and it, it's, I think it's deeply connected to what we had mentioned before, the participate, participation trophy culture, the single mom culture, or just the general mom culture period where it's you fall down and that it's time to cry and it's time to beg for help or wait for help to come to you because you're creating such a fuss. And, uh, and, and then, but now there's definitely people then crowding around you say, Oh, come on, come on, come on, get up. Uh, or like, Oh, I got you and like come down or not even pull you up. Just come down there with you while you're on the ground and saying, let's cry together. Let's feel this out. Yep. And who knows, maybe depending on the context, that's necessary for a brief period of time. But then it's like, come on, give me your hand, get your ass up. Let's sort out how to do this properly. So it doesn't Oh, that's an get. easy trap to fall into. Absolutely. There's, there's a, a, a tension. There's a, a bit of a twisted stroke of ego there getting that attention because of that. Mm-hmm. And some ego protection. I'm not good enough. So it's okay. Uh, absolutely. And then, you know, of course, with the single mother issue, a lot of that occurs because it's a mothering thing to do. You know, they want, of course, a mother wants life to be fair for her child. Yeah. You know, that's a big deal. Women are very much geared uh, in a communitarian way so that they level the playing field for the survival of their children. But the reality is, and the males know, the ones that are out there hunting, providing, they know life is not fair and there are monsters out there that will eat you if sure. you're not prepared. And random circumstances that will pop up. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, such as, it's not like you invited uh, to be electrocuted, right? <laughs> the funny thing is I did. <laughs> <laughs> I had I had cranial rectal intrusion of the worst possible kind, which if you don't understand, this is your cranium. And of course, <laughs> right up the rectum. <laughs> Uh, and I, I chose not to validate whether uh, a junction was energized and I lifted the connection oh, okay. without testing All right. because yes. I was in a hurry right. because I mean, I could make excuses. I was in a hurry. I was a single dad. I had to get off on time so I could get the inoculations for my children to get into daycare. Mm-hmm. So I didn't want to be late and I was going to be late and I didn't want to walk 300 feet, get the tester guys. I was 27 days late. I, t- yeah. I lost all my money, all my assets. I lost everything. Mm-hmm. I lost the use of my hands. For had just to have surgery. Little test. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it just goes to show how some one small decision can make a huge difference in your life. And, but it's funny how the universe works is that. Sometimes when these awful things happen, it brings us to even greater understanding of of how things work and and, and forming better strategies. I mean, well, if if you've got the smarts and the wherewithal to learn from them, uh, some people just don't have that in Right. Some people don't. And I tell a lot of my kinds, guys, some doors will close, but others always open. You just have to be ready to go through them. Right. You got to see that shit. And they, and, uh, you know, a lot of these guys, they don't have that capacity because they're still waiting for that handout and saying, look, there it is. Come on. I'll even like carry you through the threshold. And, um, and a lot of them are just lacking that, that, that inner tiger to just like, go, like, come on, like just dust yourself off or get that, that, uh, that inspiration to move yeah. and get it done. So it's been my observation that that is very true. I think our poor young men today, even guys of our age, we, we're under environmental uh, assault. 
and we're under social assault and we're under assault in our media to basically feminize us. And it's been quite easy. I mean, you can look at some of the studies done over the last 45 years, men have lost almost 50% of their testosterone. And that's what makes men, men in many mm-hmm. cases, yeah. uh, it, it, it reduces their confidence because of that. I mean, if, if anything, testosterone is builds muscle, it uh, aids in thinking and confidence. It's been maligned on, on many levels, but actually women are quite, they need testosterone too at a rate 12 times less than men, 12 to 17 times less. And it, mm-hmm. it correlates with their upper body mass and all that. But, you know, I've also seen in my life, women that doesn't have testosterone and it's quite hard on them as well. Mm-hmm. They need it as well. Uh, and it looks like we're under assault. I mean, I've read that book, Estro Generation. Have you seen that one? No, no, but I'll check that. Astro, I'm a huge fan look, look of up, uh, uh, Look up Estro Generation. I don't agree with everything, but the environmental salt, like from atrazine use on our crops, uh, birth control that's in our water, it's been around for, you know, since the 60s. It cannot be filtered out unless it's reverse osmosis or steam reformation. Uh, that tends to uh, uh, land on receptors in our body and, and minimize the ability of a, a man to use his testosterone. And it's that and processed foods. Look at the last 20 years. There is a huge explosion in diabetes, prediabetes. Mm-hmm. Uh, 80% of American uh, or 80% of the women are now overweight. And that means 20 pounds or more. What is it? Right. Almost 48% are morbidly obese now. Um, yeah. You can look those stats up. The average weight of a woman now is 168.7 pounds at five foot four. And that's re- age range 18 to uh, 60. That's more than a man. So mm-hmm. um, their bodies are affected by these environmental things as well. Processed yep. foods, lack of testosterone would cause that sort of weight gain, the insulin insensitivity. These are some of the things that I'll coach on as well. Right. Uh, as you could tell I'm very much into fitness and mm-hmm. and research and uh longevity it's it's uh, all about the earth suit you got to maintain the earth suit people uh you only get one and it will wear out and it'll stop mm-hmm. working someday you might as well keep it in tip-top shape sure I'm a, but, I'm a so. huge advocate of hormone health um because it's when you start researching it, it you realize that it's like a second brain it's, it's highly complex. And when it gets thrown off, um, either through a deficit or a misalignment, it really, really can wreak havoc on the body in multiple ways, because it's like a web that's connected to so many different organs um, and functioning and pathways. So it can screw up the, the, the highways that run between certain functions and, uh, and really mess it up. And, um, I, I went through a uh, like a big crash with my my hormones and it made me extremely depressed. I was gaining weight. Um, it was it, my it was hard for me to sleep. My sleep yeah. got really messed up. I was like waking up at like three o'clock in the morning for no reason. So I was, I was developing insomnia, and uh, I didn't know how to like what the hell was going on. And a friend of mine at the gym said, Hey, you know, just go to find a clinic and get tested. Mm-hmm. And I was on the verge of being hypogonadal. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and for people who don't know that what that is, it's basically like your balls shutting down. Like you, you're not producing testosterone as much in your body. And according to the, you know, the government standard, I was, I was close to being um, at their lowest level. And so the doctor, he was smart enough to not follow those government standards because they're really messed up. They are. Uh, It's like what they think is low is like incredibly low. Uh, They've changed the standard four times in the last 15 years. Yeah. So he got me on TRT and I continued doing my, my research and it completely shifted things around like night and day. I was getting fantastic sleep my thinking became clearer. I became happier. Um, Bad things that happened in my life just pretty much rolled off like water off a duck's back. It's truly Um, amazing. Yeah. I was less moody. Um, Like I would, you know, no more snapping at my kids when they would do something annoying. 
Um, it would just be like, ah, like just kind of laugh it off. Like, ah, I'd be a little kid, like whatever. Yeah. And, um, and then of course, like I just, I, my, my, the, the, the fat wasn't going off, but my build, my body's ability to acquire more fat was substantially cut down. And of course the muscle came on a lot easier and it was just like, I was back to being a man again. It was, it was incredible. Yep. Your body's operating like it was at 30 years old. Now mm -hmm. think of it this way too. Um, so you got your body operating at 30 years old, your depression's gone. Mm -hmm. You don't feel bad. It's an amazing thing to feel like that again. Like you did basically when you were young, your body's operating at its peak potential. Imagine for the ladies too if they lose their hormones and we're not just talking estrogen, we're talking testosterone as well. Many women face this. There's something going on where the testosterone is dropping in the population, environmental birth control, whatever it may be. You know how Justin, you felt depressed and down. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, am it's amplified in our, in our, our, in the females. I mean, if you don't think that hormones play a huge role in your thinking and your instincts because the hormones are a communication between different parts of your body and how they should operate. You know, it's a communication pathway. It moves at the speed of blood instead of the speed of light. Right. Yep. Um, it, think of a woman going through her menstrual cycle. Do you see the moody shift? And sometimes they're not even aware of it themselves. The mood shift, the swing, the snappiness, then the I'm sorryness, and then the, you know, the cuddliness, the whole thing, and they're not fully aware of it, but that's how powerful those shifts in hormones are. You have the three forms of estrogen that go up and down. You have progestins, progesterone, prolactin moving around. You have testosterone that peaks in clients when they start their ovulatory uh, phase, their testosterone rises. It does for a reason, you know, to support extra muscle, the seeking out of a mate. It affects thinking in ways that I don't think is fully understood mm -hmm. uh, and, and recognized on how important it is. Uh, and, and you can see it. And if you think, oh yeah, all right. So, well, my recommendation is, yeah, there's, there's natural ways to improve your health and balance hormones for sure. Right. If you've done all those things and you cannot get into the mid range or the upper mid range, I am an advocate of putting yourself into that upper mid range or even close to the top range because the differences are vast. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like when you're a teenager in your twenties, you are so much more capable and so sharp. Uh, testosterone therapy has got a bad rap because it is synonymous with the young men of cycling steroids, which it is not. Mm -hmm. We're talking bioidentical hormones that are put into the non super physiologic levels, which is essentially a natural level. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's an important factor. And then with, uh, with our modern diets, uh, the environmental assaults that we're under, it's almost like you could maybe draw some dots between a strange wild conspiracy theory. Yes. Yes. And I've got with, a friend and, who and then add that. in, and then add in modern feminism, which if you take a critical eye and you look at it, wow, wouldn't it be something if these strange, creepy powers that be decided in the late seventies with modern feminism, if we could just get women to hold off having children until they're 35, 85% will not have children. Mm -hmm. What an amazing population control device. Right. They don't mm -hmm. even know it. And after 35, only 15% will have, it's just enough 15 to 20% that they will always point to the exceptions. Oh, well, this 45 year old had it. This 45 year old I know had children. Yeah, one in five will enough for you to know it, but the majority won't. Right, and you I almost draw an amazing a... anti-population theory. Yep. Yep. and it, it it seems obvious. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you get and with that with that that push is it's getting uh, more women into the workforce, not as a and it's touted as like, oh, this is really great for you. Not but for that no, reason. No, they're like, no, this is more money for us. This is producing more taxpayers, right? Because before that, it was one, one guy, right, out there working, paying taxes on his income mm -hmm. and supporting, you know, either a wife or wife and children who were not taxpayers, right? right? They were just consumers. And it's like, well, how can we sort this out so that we have more people out there working and making more tax money for us? 
All right. And it's like, ah, okay, here we go. And, uh, and, and you just mix it up with all the other things that you mentioned and, um, and, and you got yourself a pretty big mess. Really yeah. Big and if, mess. if you parse the data just right, mm. even though our population is stable, it's stable for what reason? Immigration. Mm-hmm. Not because we're having our 2.4 children to make it stable. Right. Right. Yeah, there has definitely been an attack on nuclear family, re, uh, redefining, just taking all these things and redefining them completely. And, uh, and I mean, I'm, I'm still questioning at this point, the institutionalized state run version of marriage, but oh, I'm, 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 I'm very much pro, I'm very much pro family, because mm-hmm. I'm like, thinking, well, people are like, oh, I want to get married, I want to get married. It's like, is it really you want to get married or you want to have a family? Because pe- humans have been having families long before marriage ever existed. You know, we, 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 we pair bonded, we raised children. Um, there might have been like a larger community sense of raising children, like families were a lot closer together and mothers would raise many children when we were like more tribal in nature. But it was still, there was family. And there was no marriage. Maybe there was like a ceremony or something like that, but there was no rules. There was no regulations. There was certainly no tax situation involved. Uh, and if people wanted to split for whatever reason, it was something that was dealt with within the community. And that is it. And now we have, it's completely government restricted. And I'm asking people like, I, again, in Clubhouse where people are talking about marriage and getting together and I say, why what are the benefits to you of getting married aside from a tax break? And they can't think of anything and they, they divert to their beliefs. They're like, oh, well, it, you know, it goes to my beliefs. It's like, well, that's just how you feel about it. What are the actual things that are tangible that creates a benefit for getting married? And they can't answer it. Oh, so Justin, I actually teach a, a, five, a five-day class on long-term relationships Mm-hmm. and marriage and how to maintain it. And part of that is I do not advocate for modern marriage because I've done the research and there's only maybe one or two things that you can even look to that would be beneficial. And that would be a provider of insurance. You can, if you're married or domestic mm-hmm. partner, you can gain insurance through that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, there in California, there's no more common law. So you can't do that if you're not a domestic partner or married by the state recognized. However, the tax implications in California, they don't exist anymore. So mm-hmm. there's no benefit for that state marriage. In California, divorce is a billion dollar industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and now that they've eliminated common law, there's something out there that's called ceremonial marriage which offers all the pomp and circumstance, but it is not a state contract. You could write vows and you could keep those vows. They're verbal. Yeah, that's great. But you can do all of that and you can commit and you can do a lot. If you're a single man today, you can create a a revocable trust for all your assets, your houses, your cars, and it can all be owned by that. And you could be the executor and you can protect it all that way without even any other agreement. Mm -hmm. Uh, As soon as you get that state involved, they start poking into it. But if, even if you have children with that woman, you're still, you're still under family court for the benefit of the children, but without common law, the alimony is not there. So I would recommend if you're doing that, that's fine. And if she's going to be stay at home, pay her salary for that. Mm-hmm. It's important. I also talk to, to guys and recommend on, on doing their finances. Like I do don't be that lazy guy that goes to work, you know, hands over the paycheck, let her handles it all. You know, they're not really built for that. You handle it, you know, give her a joint account. And then every other account you can is yours to handle and handle like a man. You need to do that. You need to maintain that control. Uh, And if she's not really agreeable with that, she really doesn't have the genuine desire to be your wife Mm -hmm. uh, or ceremonial wife. Um, So, I mean, those are hard decisions to make. I, I, I have a, an analytic tool that I help guys with as they're making a decision six months to 12 months in with uh, their, their uh, girlfriends that they might be considering having a long-term relationship with. And it's based on attributes that they exhibit uh, as the honeymoon phase goes off on where mm-hmm. they might need to make corrections. So, I mean. 
And again, that comes back to what we mentioned at the very beginning of this, which is living from your own mental point of origin. Yeah. Because when you do that, when you are, are in that framework of, of, uh, of, of mental capacity, that's when you can come to a lot of these decisions with good logical clarity and saying, okay, what's best for me? And then you can sort out how to, how to vet that woman properly for your aims. Does this person fit within right. my program? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Vetting is very important. There's some really nice, nice books out there to help you. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, Richard Cooper has an excellent chapter on vetting. I go a little further than that. Once that vetting is done, I start looking at, at actual behavior, uh, behaviors that they do, mm -hmm. particularly how they're influenced with their girlfriends. Are they an influencer or are they the influence? Things like that. Family interactions. Does her family come first before you? Mm -hmm. You know, is there, is there requirements for you to meet expectations of being with her? These are some of the things that might indicate troubles down the road. So I got, I got a bunch of sure. those that I go through with the guys, but uh, as far as the state marriage, there's really no advantage. And yet, how can I say that? I am a guy sitting here that had a state marriage uh, 28 years ago. Mm -hmm. So different time at that time, actually was, there was still a tax break. I got break on the taxes. I do not today. Right. Um, there's, uh, it was just a different time, different thing. And like I tell the guys, the insurance benefit for having a state marriage really isn't there if she's not working or stay at home, uh, due to Obamacare, she's covered. You're good. So, mm -hmm. um, what is the benefit of a state marriage other than to I, support I, I, this I giant, know. this giant divorce and corporation machine, right? Well, and it's also connected to the fr the front end, which is the marriage machine. Mm -hmm. And because that's deeply connected to media, you look at Hollywood and how that mm -hmm. whole thing is promoted of, of a romantic partnership and how that right. leads to marriage and all those, you know, rom-coms and so on. Yeah. And, uh, and then that's linked to the diamond industry. And if you look into the diamond industry, that is a huge bloody mess. Uh, and then how then that is linked to the, Mer the the visions and programming of how marriages should run by like yeah. you look at like sitcoms and um in teaching guys like you, you they're all yes dears all these guys are all bumbling idiots on these family sitcoms i don't know a single one where the man is a great leader right he's always screwing up in the eyes of the woman and having to say i'm sorry at the end of every episode mm -hmm. He's always they, the butt of jokes. They always project her as the mommy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then you, so it's like projecting this model of how relationships should run. And then once that doesn't work, because it won't, you run into the, the downfall and then boom, like that activates the whole divorce machine. It's brilliant, isn't it? It is. I mean, it really is. And then, and and then it, that play, goes it into, plays to the majority. I mean, if we're going to talk alpha and beta uh, scenarios, 80% mm -hmm. of us maybe say beta, whatever. But most men, let's, let's take that 80%. Most men, you know, don't want to go and date. It's hard work and they have to work on themselves. And it just, it just takes some fortitude that most men do not have. Mm -hmm. it, and, and so they fall into this trap. Man, if I got married... I get some poon on tap. It'd be wonderful. I'm good with it. I like kids. I, I just, that's what I want. And they really do want that. Mm -hmm. And yet they almost, if they're going to be successful at it, they have to approach that upper end to where that is not the most important thing in their life to attract that and make it successful. Yes. Yeah. They're, they're missing key elements. It's not, it's, it's fine. I will agree with you. It's totally fine to have those desires, but achieving those desires is often a mystery to, to a lot of guys. They don't it realize really is. what is actually meant to, uh, or what's required of them to have the life that they want. Yep. And, uh, and, and they don't get it. And that's a sad thing because that's not taught in schools. That's not taught by parents. Well, why? Well, because we've got a lot of single moms out there. Or if the dad is around, he's a wet towel. Yeah. Right? Yes, yeah, right. And if you, if you speak frankly like we do in many circumstances, it's rather unflattering. So it, it's, it's untasteful um, to a lot of people that are trained in, 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 in modern ways of thinking. Yes. But I'll tell Think you about this. It. 
Think about it. When we say mental port of origin, it is really the ultimate liberal agenda is that individuality that says you're the mental pointers. It's really the most liberal thinking you can have. Yet in our society, in Western society, that's not what liberal means anymore. You know, oh, you're, you're not conforming to the approved method. Right. Right. It's completely opposite. So right. it's, 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 a, it's a tricky thing. Yes. And, and you get it, when you get into it, you, and you start poking around in some of these guys' heads, they don't have any sort of standards for themselves. They, they, sub, they, they subject themselves to the standards of the collective. And they, because the collective says, hey, if you bond with this, you'll be good. It'll all work out. And uh, it will only work out, but not for them. It'll work out for the system. Yeah. <laughs> not for the guy. <laughs> the guy gets used and abused. Yep. And then spit out once he's, he's you know, a, a, a dry, withered up little raisin. I know it. Yeah. And, and, and that benefits the powers that be, the corporations. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, I work in the corporate environment now. Uh, I'm not... I'm not flying on helicopters, doing climbing poles and all that stuff. I mean, I've been a power line the most of my career. Mm-hmm. Also, I, uh, I earned a degree and became a PMP for about seven years. And that's a project management professional mm-hmm. and realized that cube life, not for a guy like Thor. <laughs> no. <laughs> I've no. been exposed to too many men too long. And so, yeah, corporate life is definitely the uh, corporate life is modern. I know, I know it's still capitalism, but if you get into it, it, these S&P 500s or even further down to the, the 1,000, it, it's essentially a very collectivist way of thinking rather than capitalist. It's, it's everything's the same. Everybody treated the same. I mean, I'm working for this corporation. I was forced to sign up to a social media platform called uh, My Fairy God Boss. Oh, boy. And we get emails every day, and it's, it's, it's gender-specific, But all males have to do this too, because, you know, being in management, we have to become, we have to have allyship. Do you know what allyship means? Mm, Please, please look it up. Please look up allyship on Google. Mm -hmm. Allyship is the latest thing coming out of the universities that because of our unconscious bias, which we're not aware of, we need to be taught how to be allies to the females. We need to make sure they're getting the opportunities. Even if those opportunities might exist for us, we should step aside as a good ally and allow them to take those opportunities because that is what is just. Uh, so this, this email we get every day for this social media platform called My Fairy God Boss is essentially a bunch of hands that are cackling about problems at work to HR. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're being taken seriously, at least here in California, because of the um, laws that were passed in the last uh, two terms of the governorship. <clears throat> and you're seeing a lot of it come to fruition with the quality of entertainment that's coming out. You're getting a lot of woke entertainment because what's happened here is you have to hire your employees by what's called um, diversity and inclusion rules. So you have to hire a third party to do a demographic study of your area within so many miles of where this is headquartered at, the job, and then you have to match the local demographic in order to interview uh, uh, the first eight candidates. I hope that makes sense. So if if you're in West Hollywood, imagine what the demographic is going to be for a headquarter such maybe as Disney. What are those writers? What are those directors? What are those producers? What are the creative types that you're going to have to match in a demographic? Even though that might be an extremely unusual demographic, you got to, you got to follow the, you got to follow the protected class. So you have to have the gender of women's, you got to have the racial protected classes and you got to have the sexually orientated uh, classes. And now you have to look at the demographics of the area. If I'm West Hollywood, I'm going to have a particular group that might be a particular mindset and, because that's their little enclave. So my first eight candidates, which all might be qualified for the job are, are by law being interviewed first. I mean, that's very generic the way I'm talking and there's a little piece here and there that might not fit, but that has been that way in California for a while. Yeah. It, and in my industry, in order to make my corporation uh, more compliant, what they've done since as powered linemen, it's 99.9% men. And there's reasons for that because upper body strength, you have to be required 
to lift 75 pounds over your head, upper body strength is going to eliminate most women straight up. Mm -hmm. And that's for your safety. I mean, if you fall, you have to be able to hold yourself. I mean, that's the basis to get in. You at least start out that way. Right. Mm -hmm. And of course the body belts uh, pinch on a woman's hip because the angle of their thigh bones to hip is slightly different than men. So it's extremely painful for them to be in the body belts of our design that, that just so happens to be a pole or a tower or off the helicopter. Can they do it? Yes, but it's uncomfortable. Probably not what you want to do. And it's dangerous. So the industry I'm in where we actually do the actual work is 99.9% men. So in order to become compliant, essentially the workforce has become 85% contract contractors mm -hmm. for the corporation. So within the corporation, we are fully state compliant and a leader in diversity and inclusion. Whether that's a good thing or bad thing, it's going to bring to be seen by the shareholders. Right now, the, the stock prices remain stagnant for a couple of years, but we'll see. Uh, as far as the actual workforce, it's 85% contractor. Good for me, plenty of work out there. But mm -hmm. uh, I think you'll see that in more and more industries here in California and maybe across the nation because of these kind of unusual diversity and inclusion laws. And they're changing the name too. At least here in California, it's not diversity and inclusion anymore. It's called cultural literacy. You'll start to hear that in the media as well. Are you culturally literate? Right. So keep your, keep your eye open for that. And then if you're not, there, oh. you, you're, there's bias against people who aren't. And then yeah. you, have to be, you have to be trained. But that, that's right. That bias is okay. Mm -hmm. The bias of you being the individual is not. Right. You have Even to, though they will say mm -hmm. you should be an individual and you should, you know, they say you should, but they don't really mean it. Right. Because it, it, there's, it, it doesn't, it doesn't go down. It always sounds nice to, to be, to be told you should, you should be an individual. Uh, it be, and it doesn't sound nice to saying, Hey, you know, it's not, very acceptable we want you to join the collective uh it just doesn't go down well because i mean we still kind of have a um you know a bad taste in our mouths when you hear the word communism right people still they they have like bad feelings so if you put that out there it's going to trigger some folks so i think that um they try to keep that out of the vernacular and anything kind of that leads to you know borg like thinking <laughs> you know? <laughs> a lot of it is very Marxist based though. It is communitarianism for yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's very subtle. And uh, the, the problem is that guys are just listening to it. It's pretty they're, effective they're, actually. I mean, yeah. I got to say, as far as the hustle, it's been very effective in the corporate environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they, they don't realize that, that the corporate environment, um, it actually drives men down because we, when we're just looking at a biological level, you're sitting in front of a computer screen for eight to 12 hours a day, not moving and, you know, probably eating delivered packaged food, drinking from plastic water bottles mm -hmm. uh, and um, not getting any sunlight and, uh, and, and being in just, uh, there's no life in it, right? It's all plastic, uh, you know, foam ceilings, uh, really horrible, uh, you know, halogen lights and, um, and, and your personality has to fit within a very small mold. Like there, you have to communicate on all levels within a certain expectation. And it really just takes you away from who you are. And uh, so I applaud the guys who are just like, you know what, I'm done with this. This does not sit right. I don't care that I'm gonna lose this great income because that's what they, they, they dangle that bone in front of you. Be like, yeah, you want this, don't you? You know, but at what cost? It's not that good anymore. I'll tell you, mm -hmm. they're not offering pensions anymore. They're offering right. kind of crappy 401ks where you don't actually have the control you used to have. Yep. And it's not that good. And I, I think that if you're smart and you're a young man, you look at high paying craft skills to start or STEM, it's yes. really the only way you can go. And if you dedicate yourself to that and just say, use yourself as a craft, say you want to be a power lineman. And for when you start, you're going to make 70 a K a year. Mm -hmm. By the time you're in your third year, you're a hundred K. 
By the time yeah. you're a full journeyman, four years in, you're making 100 to 300K with overtime. Now, if you go to a four-year college, you're coming out with uh, essentially a 100K or more debt, unless mm-hmm. you got a scholarship. Yep. That's a mortgage, gentlemen. That will take you years and years to pay off. Imagine making 100K for three or four years and taking half of that and putting it into your own trust. Someone that taught you to put this away, taught you how to be a man. Imagine now two years of that, you could pay cash for your extension to get through college and you could earn a degree that's just as valuable. Exactly. Uh, and there's no debt. Not only is there no debt, you have residual income based on the income you've been saving. So there's a lot of important things that can be done in today's environment to not play or to either play in that game for your own ends and not get trapped in it or to play outside of that corporate environment. And you're yes. seeing more and more people, the hustle economy is on the move. The mm-hmm. advent of crypto, unbelievable. Oh. I've been in crypto for six years now. It's unbelievable, extremely yep. volatile, but that volatility is starting to even out because people are realizing exactly what's going on with the printing of trillions and trillions of dollars. Yep. Well, and they're not taking a big enough picture, right? Scope back, look at the whole bigger picture of crypto, right? Adjust just Bitcoin alone or Ethereum alone. You'll just see it. You know, if you zoom in close, yeah, it goes like this every day, but you zoom out, you'll see the pattern of flow and it's a continual growth upwards, right? So, but I don't want to get into crypto. That's like yeah. this whole other thing, you know, but, but yes, your, your point in learning a trade is fantastic because even if you don't go into that line of work, let's say you do something else. If something happens to that something else, you have extremely reliable skills to fall back on. Yeah. Whether it's woodworking, automotive, um, you know, uh, or STEM or anything else that has, has you working either with your mind or with your hands um, and I would definitely say with your hands because it's a dying skill out yeah. there. So if you know how to work uh, plumbing, electrical, um, you know, uh, uh, anything contract work related, homes are still getting built, right? So it's like if you're related, you know, concrete work, bricklaying, masonry, any of that stuff, we're still using these raw materials and we still need people to be able to do that stuff. And it's becoming more and more rare because people are just not following that path. So you become more in demand if you have this knowledge and these skills to fall back on should you need to. So before we like wrap up in here, um, I, you mentioned something that I think was really cool that I want you to kind of expand on a little bit. In the pre-conversation, you mentioned um, uh, visualization exercises as being the one productive routine or habit that you have for being successful as a man. So could you kind of talk about that as, you know, one of the, the last two, few things that we touch on here? Sure. I'll do that. And then when I'm done, I'll give you your viewers a uh, remind me, I'll give your viewers one thing they can do to immediately improve their outlook on life and start seeing improvements. Awesome. One yeah. thing they could do absolutely today, and it will start it will start you on the path of living a positive dream. So let's talk about visualization for this is an outgrowth of what I learned when I burned the skin off my hands and nearly killed myself. All right. You see, I got that little deformed finger right there. Mm-hmm. It was so painful to have the skin ripped off my hands, arms, and face that I really just kind of wanted to die. But I wasn't dying. I was just going to live there with exposed nerves. So it came to a point where I was sitting in there and I was hyperventilating and that was making me feel worse. And I looked at the clock and I said, okay, there's a second hand and a minute hand. I am going to watch that for five minutes. I'm on morphine heavy, but I'm still feeling it. Five minutes. Let's just slow it down five minutes. And then I just let it all loose and I'll, I'll, I'll puff and puff and scream, whatever. So I'd make that five minutes. And when I first did it, I got the five minutes, huff and puff, made it worse, dot, dot, dot. Then I said, okay, five more minutes. And so in that five minute period, I made it. I said, okay, next one's six, next one's seven. And I would live in these five minute increments and I'd stop panicking when the five minutes was up. And then after that, I remember being taught by a martial arts instructor when, when I meditated was to focus on a light that's about six to 20 feet away from me with my eyes closed. Try to imagine what that light would look like. 
and clear my mind of everything else that's in my mind. Just a small pinpoint, maybe it's the size of a baseball, maybe it's the size of a pencil, but I'd get it and I would have the color be white. All of the thoughts on my mind would focus out there on that light. And so I would do that and I would reduce my pain by doing that. And then I would control it. I would learn to change the color. And so that would be a way that I could start to affect my breathing, change my thinking patterns and focus on the light and nothing else. And this took practice, but I was able to get through that. And then when I finally got home and I had to rebuild my life and pay back the $75,000, I started doing it every night. Every night I would do that exercise by imagining a blue light. And when I get all of the, all the thoughts out of my head, I would imagine scenes from my favorite movies where there was a poignant point to be made. And I would imagine myself as the hero of that movie scene. And I would play it over and play it over. And then I would blend it with the goals that I had for that week or for the next day. And it might start out small or it might be something in long range, seeing myself in the future. But I would do that for at least 10 to 15 minutes right before I fell asleep, right when you go into that pre-conscious mind, which is a part of self-hypnotism. And so those visualizations do work over time. And, and it's those small actions that add up that create massive results. I am training my subconscious mind, my thought patterns, and I am the hero of my own movie. I am this man that's going to accomplish these things. So my pre-conscious or subconscious knows this. So it becomes automatic for me the next day to hit the gym, make the phone calls I need to make, express the confidence and presence I need to be successful in my meetings or in my daily life. And so this is a journey over time. And that's what I meant by visualization being extremely important. I'm a visual man as an artist, much like you. Yeah. Visualizations are incredible. You understand the relationship of lines, how lines are related to each other when you're drawing and you're creating something and you can almost see the depth of it as you're doing it. Uh, it's an amazing thing. It's hard to put into words because it's very much a something you feel, which is unusual for men. But when you're drawing, you can feel it. As you start to clear your mind of all of the thoughts and you're focusing on your light and you're playing these scenes in your head, maybe it's, maybe it's doing something fun, like riding a motorcycle, I don't know, flying a helicopter, whatever it is, it can just be something to rid yourself of the cluttering thoughts so that you can just insert the small goals that you need to accomplish. And that's it. That's been extremely successful for me. And that's what I, I go through about a 15 minute exercise with my clients doing that. Uh, I use a little bit of trance techniques, put them into just a small trance and then have them do it on their own. Um, and it, it's just a small habit that works very well. I'm controlling their breathing or they're controlling their breathing, putting their mind where it needs to be. That's really it by visualization. And if you look, you can read very similar things when you read uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's biography. He envisioned himself as already being Mr. Olympia. Many athletes do this and they call it the zone, right? But there's almost no thought, but there, there is an understanding of you. You already are where you need to be. Now you're just going through the motion. Yes. And it's a lot of it is connected to how you feel. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's it, making note of how you feel in those envisioned situations. So it's not mm -hmm. just an intellectual exercise. It's an emotional right. exercise as well. Feeling the comfort or the joy or excitement of that. No, I'm glad yeah. you pointed out when I actually do it with a client, we actually mm -hmm. talk about how their skin feels out in the sun. We get right. them used to feeling sensations. We imagine sensations before we go into it just for that very reason. Right. Right. Uh, like when I go to the, cause I, I, I race uh, motorcycles. So when I go on the track, I have to do that because um, oftentimes fear will get in the way of enjoyment. So I do visualization exercises of, reprogramming the situation and turning it into a, a joyful, uh, exciting thing because people don't realize the brain chemically doesn't know the difference between fear and excitement. Yeah. It's the same process. You're just having a different visual or auditory stimuli, right? Or experiential stimuli. And, um, and so you can easily switch these things around yeah. and the brain won't know the difference, right? right. Until after the fact, you know, no. Yes. Visualization is powerful. I picked those techniques up uh, from the Gracies. Uh, I spent six years or five years there mm -hmm. at the Grace Academy in the 90s. So 
uh, learning Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. A lot of those older guys really were into that visualization. Yeah. And breathing techniques, you know. Yeah. It's a powerful thing. And it's so sad that people laugh at it. Like they're like, oh, that's some woo stuff. Or they try to attack your masculinity um, mm -hmm. by telling you like, oh, that's some like, you know, feminine like woman bullshit and it's like no you're actually taking more control of yourself you're you're actually tapping into your unconscious which most people are just letting the system tap into it's and a superpower <laughs> it is. it's a superpower it is absolutely so yeah. what is uh so what is this uh this lesson that you want to tie up uh, okay one lesson for all of your listeners that's an amazing thing it's rather difficult to do but i promise you if you do this your outlook on life will change to the positive in unbelievable ways. And here's what it is for every man out there. Number one, stop listening to all talk radio and news media of any kind, social, CNN, CNBC, Fox, stop. Now, the first couple of weeks, there will be some withdrawal symptoms. But all of these inputs that you're listening to while you're driving or watching TV, are all based in negative emotions. They're all intended to amplify those emotions so that you'll pay attention and so that your subconscious gets a kick out of it. After two weeks, continue this on for another 30 days and see how amazing your life is by not knowing that there was a shooting halfway around the world and that if you look around yourself, the weather's great and the people around you are amazing. And your attitude and your shift will absolutely stun you once you eliminate that from your life. Yes. So that's simple. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I've, I've recommended this to a number of my friends who, especially around the political times, mm. uh, I, I say, man, just unplug. You're, you're getting all wrapped up about somebody else's life that is not your own. It's amazing. And as people get older, they look me in the face when I mentioned this, especially clients. Well, how do I stay informed? I said, well, think about what you're being informed about and what they're actually doing to you. Mm -hmm. Makes no difference in your life whatsoever. You're still going to do the things you do. Why aren't you being informed about what's right in front of you instead of about something that's off in la-la land, that's often manipulated to make you think in a particular fashion? Sure. And it's done through negative reinforcement, which is the most powerful. Well, and the information that they're getting informed about is a processed, manufactured, and minimized version of how much mm -hmm. is actually there. We only get to see on CNN what we're allowed to see on CNN, right? Or talk any, radio. Any platform, whatever. really. Yeah, they're I all just, yeah, I just, yeah, I just chose rates. that one. Yeah, yeah, I just chose that one as just an example. But any, you're right, any media outlet we're only allowed to see what we're allowed to see. And, and so I've had my clients that have actually done this be amazed and they'll come back or, or some that are really resistant and say, well, I have to have something. And I say, okay, if you're going to have to have something, I want you to find something that's positive and in long format, much like this podcast. I don't want mm -hmm. short format. I want long format because context is going to change everything for you. Yes. It's those little bites that really just jump in there and start affecting your, your unconscious. Right. Yep. Yeah, we're amazing creatures. We have these electrochemical stalks called eyes and these ears that, uh, and we are programmed and we cannot stop that programming. Mm -hmm. it's, it's there constantly if we're being fed it. And if we're sleep deprived, it's even worse. So oh, yeah. um, don't let somebody else program you, control that. Yes, there is a uh, and, and I'll, I'll leave the viewers with this recommendation and yourself if you haven't ever seen it, but there's a fantastic documentary on, on YouTube called The Century of Self. And it's a breakdown of how uh, Freudian psychology was then used by, by uh, Edward Bernays. Who, Propaganda. Mm -hmm. Yes, who figured out how to use that psychology on a mass scale. And uh, then it was then produced in propaganda. He was being hired by, by various governments to mm -hmm. conduct their propaganda schemes. And then the same formulas are used in advertising today and in politics today, the same yep. exact formulas. They haven't changed since the, the late forties. They work. Yeah. Yeah. Because back before that, it was, they would say like, all right, this is our pen. It does the great best job. It's the best pen. Yeah. It draws well. It lasts this long. You need this pen. 
right? Now it's like, this pen will make you feel so sexy. All the mm -hmm. women will want you if you buy this pen, right? Mm -hmm. and, the, and the guys are like, yeah, I want women. I need that pen. Yeah, <laughs> you know? that's true. And it has so nothing true. to do with the pen. It's just like, mm -hmm. you just want to feel sexy, don't you? Right? You'll be a man if you own this pen. <laughs> Justin, it's all about the poon. It's all about the poon. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And for guys, you know, we're just, let's just leave them with that mystery because I know what you're saying. They don't, but you know, they'll, hopefully they'll figure it out because <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> what you're saying is not what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Thor, it was fantastic chatting with you. It was, uh, it was, it was worth the wait. Um, and, uh, you know, it was really great. And I will let you know when this hits the airs. You bet. If anybody wants to find me, become durable.com. You can also sign up for my long-term uh, relationship maintenance course right there. Just give me your email. It's free. I'll be conducting a couple of um, free webinars coming up over the next three to four weeks uh, going over that uh, material. So become durable.com. See you there. Awesome.